Our second lesson is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, beginning at verse 2. Hear now the word of the Lord. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, come to Him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, He is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's own people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning in this reading from 1 Peter, the apostle calls us to be the people of God. You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. What does it mean to be God's own people? What does it mean to be God's own people in and among the other commitments and loyalties and allegiances of our lives? It's a problem of dual citizenship. Would you pray with me? Living God, we open our lives before your word and the speaking of your spirit. Speak to our hopes and our fears. Speak to the good that we do and the good that we have left undone. And transform us into the image of Christ our Savior, whose voice we are listening for. Amen. Peter is writing to people who are living out of place. He begins his letter in chapter 1 to the exiles of the diaspora. And some of the people that Peter was writing to were Jewish exiles. Now they had been living in Asia Minor for 300 years after the Babylonian defeat of Israel and they had been exiled to that place. But they were still exiles from their home in Jerusalem. And some of the people that Peter was writing to were natives of Asia Minor. That was their home culture. But now that they believed in Christ, they were strangers to their home culture. So the Jews who were exiles already, who have now decided to follow Christ, are double exiles. Because they don't fit in with their community anymore. And the Gentiles who are native to that region, who have decided to follow Christ, now they are exiles. They are strangers in their world. At this point in history, the Roman Empire had not yet begun a persecution of Christians officially, but they were like immigrant communities today around the world. They were resident aliens. They were culturally and religiously different than the majority population. And like immigrant communities today around the world, they were subject to abuse or mistreatment by their neighbors or by the local authorities. These Christians paid taxes. They contributed to the economy. but They were not citizens. So they did not have the protection of being official Roman citizens. They were strangers out of place in their society. Have you ever lived somewhere where you felt out of place? Have you ever lived somewhere where you felt like you didn't really belong, you kind of knew in your soul that this was not home. If you have, then I think you can identify with the people that Peter's writing to. 
When I first decided to attend seminary, I was living in Virginia. I had grown up in Virginia. It's the only place I'd ever lived. Never spent any significant time anywhere besides Virginia. And I didn't know how much Virginia was home to me until I decided to go to seminary in Southern California. So I drove out to Pasadena, California and moved into a small rented room and discovered that I was in a totally different world. I learned there's a thing called Southern California time, which is usually 15 to 30 minutes behind regular time. If they say something's going to start at 7.30, it really means it'll start at 7.45, maybe 8 o'clock. I learned there was a different dress code in Southern California. Sandals, what I have been calling flip-flops, sandals were appropriate footwear to any occasion. And if you were supposed to dress up, that meant pulling your nice pair of jeans out of the closet. And people drove fast. Where I was from, 75 or 80 miles an hour was fast. But in Southern California, that was barely keeping up. The pace car was at 95, maybe 90. I never felt at home there. I, I, I always showed up on time. I never could get into wearing sandals. The only thing I could get used to was driving 90 miles an hour, which was a lot of fun. There's something about living in Southern California that felt like my world was just off its axis a little bit. I was three hours behind everybody I knew and loved. I was three hours behind any important event that happened in the world because everything important that happened in the world happened on Eastern Standard Time. I just felt out of place. Maybe you've had experiences where you felt out of place. You felt like your soul wasn't quite at home. Peter is writing to a people who are out of place. He's writing to people who are much more deeply out of place than just moving across the country. Peter is writing to people who are fundamentally out of step with their neighbors and with their nation. But he wants them to know that even though they are out of step with their neighbors and with their nation, they are not out of step with God. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're God's own people. You belong to to God. In the month of May, I've been teaching this class on Presbyterian discipleship. And last week, we looked at the brief statement of faith in our book of confessions. We discovered that when we as Reformed Christians say what we believe, the very first thing we say is, I belong to God. You belong to God. In life and in death, we belong to God. And we learned that the very last thing that we say when we say what we believe as Reformed Christians is we belong to God. And nothing in life or in death will ever separate us from the love of God. We are God's people. You are God's own. We're not just a collection of private individual Christians on our way to heaven. We are God's own pilgrim people. And pilgrim people know in their soul that they are not at home. Pilgrim people have a kind of restless longing to be at home. Pilgrim people are walking. Pilgrim people have one foot planted in the culture and the time and the place where they live, but the other foot, the other foot's on the way. For the pilgrim people of God, that other foot is always moving toward the kingdom of God. By the grace of God, for pilgrim people, that other foot is always moving towards God's kingdom. What does it mean for us to be the pilgrim people of God? In the year 410 A.D., the Visigoths sacked Rome. Go back in time with me for just a few minutes. They defeated the city of Rome, and many of the prominent Roman citizens fled to other parts of the empire. By this point in time, Constantine had declared Christianity to be the religion of the empire. Most of them were baptized Christians. They had believed for generations that Rome was the eternal city. 
that it would not fall. And then it fell. So many of them fled. And some of them fled to northern Africa, where Augustine was the Bishop of Hippo. And they packed into the Cathedral of Carthage, looking for a word from God. Many of them blamed the Christians for the fall of Rome. In generations past, people had worshipped Rome and the Roman gods, and they had been compelled to worship the, word, the Roman emperor. But the Christians, like the Jews, believed the first commandment. You shall worship the Lord your God and have no other gods before him. So the Christians, they worshipped God alone. The Christians did not worship a nation. The Christians did not worship an emperor. The Christians did not worship a political ideology. They only worshipped God. And so when Rome fell, they took some of the blame. So these Romans packed into the cathedral at Carthage to listen to Augustine looking for a word from the Lord. And Augustine told them first, you are baptized Christians. You belong to God. He told them that Rome was a nation like many other nations that would rise and fall under the gaze of the eternal God. But they were God's own people. Many of the people in northern Africa were, were, were frustrated and demoralized because they were used to living in the culture and the comforts of Rome. And now here they were stuck out in the hinterlands of northern Africa and there wasn't any of the culture and the comforts that they were used to. They felt like exiles and strangers. Augustine can hear them complaining and so he said to them, you feel like exiles and strangers? Good. That's how you're supposed to feel. Because you're the pilgrim people of God. You're resident aliens, the people of God. Augustine told him it was time to pick up one foot and get moving on the way to the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be the pilgrim people of God? To have one foot planted and the other foot moving. We are, to my knowledge, all of us in this room, citizens of the United States of America. That's where our one foot is planted. This is our home. This is our country. My ancestors came to North Carolina from Virginia in the 1770s. They've been here ever since. This is the land where my fathers died. I would not want to live anywhere else. But, that is only one of my citizenships. You and I have another citizenship, a deeper citizenship, in the kingdom of God. Augustine said to the people he was talking to, maybe something that he would say to us, and that I might say to you. Augustine said maybe the political turmoil of their age was, was being used by God to help them yearn and long for the kingdom of God even more than they did before. To help them to be who they were as the pilgrim people of God. No matter how much we love our nation, no matter how proud we want to be of our country, we can never give up the holy discontent that comes with being God's people. We can never give up the restlessness, the impatience, the sighing of the soul that comes with longing to rest at home in God's presence. No matter how much we love where we are, we can never lose our pilgrim feet because we belong to God. God holds out a brighter vision and calls us to keep walking. God holds out a brighter vision of a kingdom that is ordered according to love for God and love for neighbor and love for self. God holds out a brighter vision of a kingdom where the individual's true fulfillment is found not in self-interest but in the well-being and flourishing of the whole community. God holds out a brighter vision of a kingdom that is known for its goodness and not for its greed. 
God holds out a brighter vision of a kingdom that is known for its peacefulness and not for its threats. God holds out a vision of a brighter kingdom where no one is afraid because everyone is loved. God holds out a vision of a brighter kingdom where all are welcome at the banquet table of Christ. That's our home country. That's where we belong. Because we're God's people. Until our feet rest in that home country, we have a calling. My friends, we have work to do. No nation will ever be the kingdom of God. But nations can get closer or they can get further away. We've been called as those who hold this dual citizenship with one foot planted here and the other foot in the kingdom of God. We've been called to hold out that brighter vision and shine that light. To call our neighbors and our communities, to call our citizens, and to call our nation to a brighter vision and a better reality. That special calling is the grace of your baptism, that you are God's own people in the world. God's grace has planted a seed of discontent in you. It's planted a restlessness for goodness. It's planted a hunger for righteousness. It's made you yearn for the well-being of all of God's children. Nurture that holy discontent in your soul. Do not let cynicism about the ambiguity of the world take away your hunger for righteousness. Do not let feelings of powerlessness before the complexities of the world take away your yearning for the well-being of all. Do not let some half measures calm your restlessness for goodness. This holy discontent is essential to who you are as God's own people. You belong to God. Do not let your feet rest until they rest in the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen.